Okay, so we're almost there. And I may take off my jacket. Yeah, hello, hello. Hey, I think, All right. I think we're streaming. Me, guys. Go ahead and do a little They're intro. streaming okay. right now if you want to listen. Well, good morning. They're, they're rounding up people around Cooley Landing. House at so I wanted to share with you a little bit of uh, footage of what it would look like out there yeah. if you've never been there. Uh, Someone is. I can hear them on this. That's weird. So they're not full. Oh, oh, they're not gonna, right there. And then, like, yeah. Do a lecture view. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Like, started yeah. not going to go back away and down to the back. That's not good. That's not good. Okay, I have to get my earphones. Maybe it's these people talking and you can hear. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's part of that, but it's being live streamed out there. See, she's going to take it back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't think we'll need the Zoom at all. Yeah. I didn't matter for this. Hey, Susan, I'm going to mute everybody because we're getting a lot of background noise. Okay. And then you, you'll just have to unmute yourself to start talking. Okay. I can hear it. What are they saying? All right, Susan, can you, you yep. are you speaking? All right, great. I think we're good. No. Uh, you know what? Doing that murdered, um, muted Myrna as well. So we won't hear them when they start. So do you want do you want to go back to them? I'll yeah, I'll just leave them on. Okay. I asked them to unmute. She, she has to actually hit unmute. I'm, I'm welcoming you all here and for the people that are going to be online joining us also. So we are here. Uh, I am Eileen McLaughlin, your tour leader. And uh, we're joined by our videographer, Myrna Hayes. And over here we have James, who here is here as our official Sierra Club outings leader today. Um, and what I want to do is go around the group really quick with a really quick introduction of just your first name and the city in which you live. And we'll just move really fast. And then we'll probably have to ask each other their names later. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start. I'm Eileen. I'm from San Jose. Myrna. I'm Myrna Hayes from Vallejo. Naomi Goodman, Menlo Park. Amelia Lasada. Okay. Uh, Steve and Nina from Redford Shores. <laughs> Where are we here? Okay. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Okay. Right. So, um, we're going to welcome you all here. I got to cover a few things of housekeeping. As those of you here have already noticed. Your connection's so just getting a little we... slow. Should, should clear up in a minute, I bet. Okay, okay. I was wondering if she was too close. No, no, that's uh, purely that's her it. data. Okay. Oh, 
What? They dropped off. We'll go back to a, a video that's looking the other direction. We were afraid of this because this happens. Um, so let me see. So maybe a little. We're going to continue on the Bay Road and uh, pick this up a little further on. Crossing Bay Road, we're going to enter the Ravenswood Open Space Preserve, where the bridge here crosses a slough that connects to the bay and is important in bringing tidal waters to the deeper areas of this marsh. The Ravenswood Open Space Preserve extends from Bay Road on the Bay Trail, extending to a walkway bridge on the far side, or walkway and bicycle bridge that would connect it to Yikes. roadways in East Palo Alto. It is a very healthy tidal marsh extends across this entire area. Beyond it lies the bay. You can see the Dumbarton Bridge and maybe if you look carefully the remnants of the old railroad bridge that sit out there on the bay. When we head out Bay Road out to the Cooley Landing Park, we have closer views of the outer edges of the marsh and the expanses of mudflats that lay beyond. This is at mid-tide or lower tide. You can see back there the bridges that cross the Dumbarton Notch. Out at the point, we can look closer at the edge of the bay and the edge of the mudflats where waterfowl that have migrated in now gather and winter color avocets are out there on the mudflats. At the far end of the point of Cooley Landing, we're at the historic location of the old Cooley Landing itself, where boats once could come in and unload goods, produce, passengers, and go back and forth across the bay. But as we can see, there is extensive mud flat and those trips could only be based on the tides and at the highest tides could boats unload or reload. Not a place for ferries today. So I hope you take some time to come out to Cooley Landing, get a feel for this yourself. much to enjoy and quiet, pleasant, and fulfilling. We're looking at the shoreline of East Palo Alto and behind it the hills that line our peninsula along the coast between us and the ocean. 
These Palo Alto stretches from San Francisco Creek to the southeast, then northwest across Bay Road and onward along the shoreline and past the Ravenswood Open Space Preserve to the railroad right of way for the old Dumbarton Rail. All right, I think Myrna is coming back on now. Okay, great. We're being fast enough, done fast enough to avoid the impacts of sea level rise. And that folks is the story behind why there needs to be a safer levee along this shoreline here in East Palo Alto. Yes, sir. Question. Question, yeah. So, um, uh, been to the different uh, 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 training things, and it seemed like one of it was that uh, having like a broad uh, mudflat and marsh, like kind of would naturally fight against sea level rise. To me, did that mean that this would kind of like as the water went up, the sediment would go up as well, as long as we have enough room for it? Or do we have to do additional stuff on top of the broad marsh to, 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 yeah. to, to yeah, the question is for so we've got this online is that the question is, is the mud flat itself high enough and going to be high enough that it is a form of protection? And is it, you know, protective? And in this case, out at Cooley Landing, if we're, we're standing, you can see how flat it is extending out. This is a very shallow part of the bay and we don't get to a fairly deep channel until it's, if you see where the old Dumbarton uh, rail swing bridge is, that's the marker of where the deepest channel is, but it's not very wide and this mud flat just slopes down to it gradually. Now the question you're raising is a big one for everyone, scientists, anyone doing a restoration project, that is where where's the sediment that's going to do that since we put dams upstream sediment coming to the bay has been reduced so we have this that's a that's a problem and how are we going to get it distributed to all these places uh the marsh itself is at risk and by the way these marshes here in east palo alto are some of the higher marshes in the bay um, they require more sediment to build up their marsh. They get some from the tides that wash it in, but these particular marshes are not connected to a source of sediment from uh, upstream and watershed. So how do we keep them growing high enough so there's marshes to keep high enough for the sea level rise to have any protective effect? Uh, so that's big questions. So I have to answer your question, that big question. <laughs> right. By itself, it needs more sediment, the sediment has to build. Yes. And then the marsh will grow on top of the sediment, so we need more sediment. Yes. And the sediment comes from, that will be the natural, or that'll be right. the mitigating thing. Solving, so that the, right. And there must be clean sediment to go in the bay, and that is some of the most expensive sediment to find these days. So developers or anyone who's messing in bay mud and comes into that are finding that's an expense problem as well. There are no creeks leading into this bay. This channel doesn't lead to a creek. I'll be talking about that a little later on. Okay, no, uh, James asked if it, what creeks fit in and there aren't any in East Palo Alto. Yes, question. Basic question. Is this the mud flat and is that the mire area? So the, the, where you see the plants, the vegetation, so that's the marsh and everything coming here, right, exposed right now at a low tide, this is all mud flat, wonderful for, for shorebirds. So it, it's a one, and, and having it exposed is one of the reasons we are a migratory stopover for so many species of birds. But that's, that, you know, so that, yeah. Ask me questions about something. Where is the levee that you're talking about? 
we'll be talking about the levy more. We're going to head to the our next destination, and this will be a little bit of a, a long walk. You know, uh, just letting folks know online that we'll be heading down toward uh, down down Bay Trail toward the shoreline. That's our next stop. Okay, all right. Let's take a walk. <laughs> Well, um, the it's it, should be answering it. We don't know what he is. Okay. Uh, yeah, you're asking whether concrete then has a negative effect on the environment. Um, and there again, it's a concrete mix with bay sand, so it's it's <clears throat> trying to use some organic really formed materials. Um, that that is artificial, and it, you know, but the concrete they have to use would be selected correct chemically. But uh, but it's it's a way to maybe build a reef because uh, that's it let it let nature take you know take its course. And that reef can be collecting sediment and other debris, and so over time. So it, there needs to be a a structure to start it off because the wet bay mud is not going to be able to do it alone. Yeah. So that's why in some places we compare, we combine, and this is where the levee comes in, we have to combine nature-based and hardscape is the, is the perspective that's being put forth. So I'm going to, I want to get people uh, direct us over to the road because this will be a narrow trail and we're going to end up blocking folks, so it'll be easier if we head over, find a trail and head over. <laughs> so um, now that channel I pointed out, you can't see it right now, but it's running along this shoreline and it's heading in here. So we'll see it down uh, later on. It's it's a slough. It becomes a slough in the marsh, and I'll be talking about it later. Uh, uh, why don't we head over to the road and kind of stay off the trail? We have been here with people riding their bikes and pushing strollers and doing all the normal things, so we don't want to block too many. And I can take questions along the trail. Sure. So um, anyway. So I'm from Belmont, St. Carlos, Belmont City area. Mm -hmm. And I did the reparation of So Myrna, mm -hmm. so yeah. can you hear me? No, Myrna's not on. No. So how do we how do we get there? Do you need to talk to do you need to talk to Myrna? Oh no, you could hear me, Eileen. Yeah, yeah, I leave I leave using the audio on Myrna's okay. phone. So we had a question come in the chat on online. Okay, I have a question. I'm going to get to your question in a minute. Okay. Okay. I, I, there's a question from the chat. What's the question here? And I'll repeat it. So, so how how are environmental? Uh, how's the issue of legacy contaminants addressed in mud flats and water? I know that's a big question. It is a big question. There's a question we're getting online about legacy contaminants in bay mud. And uh, indeed, there can be some legacy contaminants, but that in general, the mud is, is a lot cleaner than the earth that we live on. Um, that there, the beauty of mud, it, it contains what we call benthic organisms, as well as in the marsh, those benthic organisms, algae and other organisms, they are very good at breaking down a lot of pollutants. So they're busy at work constantly as the water comes in and the water comes out. They help to cleanse the water and maintain and cleanse the mud. So that's, it's not a perfect world. I can't say there's not legacy contaminants because we know that we're producing them and we're sending them to the bay every day. 
but that's the best, you know, I think uh, the answer to that question for now. So I had another question here, um, was asking about, repeat your question uh, to me. About uh, uh, Bear Island, mm -hmm. the restoration effort there out of right. uh, Rebel City. Yeah. And the mud that they used. Right. The yeah. The, uh, he was talking about the restoration at Bear Island in Redwood City, just uh, this side of Redwood Shores. And that was done with, they used a lot of sediment there to fill certain areas, but they recreated marshes with breaches. And that, uh, that was done also bringing in a lot of sediment. And levees use a lot of a lot of that dirt too, and it has to be clean dirt to be in wet areas. So, uh, but Bear Island was kind of at the leading edge. So it lucked out and found clean dirt maybe more easily than we're going to find it going forward because so many projects are, are attempting to go forward. So that's, that answer that? Yeah. You can uh, combine this with the issue of removing the dam at uh, Stanford Land, Stanford Mosquito Creek. It's full of sediment. Uh, maybe they'll donate it. Oh, we have some. Yeah. So, so I wanted to make a comment about about the contamination part, which is as the, as the sea level rises, as the bay water rises. Mm -hmm. So we have the bay has got a lot of contaminated sites all around the bay, and those are generally upland. They're not in the water yet we're close to it, but they're going to be closer and underwater when the, when the sea level rises. And that's a problem that I don't think anybody is really addressing in a serious way, comprehensive way. Right. They have a comment here from someone talking about how sea level rise is threatening the exposure of contaminants that we have in the lowland shoreline areas. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as we get by the shore here in East Palo Alto. Uh, but that is true. And he was talking about it anywhere around the bay and that that, you know, that can be anywhere that that applies. So it's a, it's a comment more than a question. I want to keep us going and moving. We've stopped to listen to answers to questions. So I want to kind of keep moving here. <laughs> We're not going to really stop. Our next stop is down by by uh, the Bay Trail. So we're going to keep walking, but we may have more questions that come up that because uh, I get them online and uh, try to share those. <laughs> I've never done it. This is my first tour like this. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, this is a uh, new experience. Okay. <laughs> right. All right. I will point out to everyone that as we walk down Bay Road, you've got again the Ravenswood Open Space Preserve over here uh, to the northeast and to the southeast along the shore's edge. It's the Don Edwards National Wildlife Managed Lands uh, that run down there to San Francisco Creek. So um, but the two areas of conserved land, which are, you know, when we stay that way and will stay as protection to the shoreline as well. So, so Eileen is going to walk to the end of the um, 
of Bay Road. And then she, if you look toward uh, where she said on the right side, this is what kind of an artist uh, is. I'm gonna go, I'll go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I saw the agenda and everything listed, but how do you, how do you actually attend via Zoom? Usually you go to the agenda. I can't remember. I've got a question here of how you get to the agenda for the East Palo Alto Joint City Council and Planning Commission meeting on Tuesday. And uh, someone who's gone to the website and uh, I- Or how do you get the Zoom link for the action? Often the Zoom links are built into the agenda oh, okay. at the okay. front of the agenda. Because I did find the agenda. So right, right. And, and so I'll probably be looking myself. I don't remember from city to city where it is. Right. Going to those meetings will be interesting to hear how they, you know, the city council members and planning commissioners respond. Right. I thought it was right. going to be a joint planning. Right. Yes, it, it is this time. So uh, we're walking past some PG&E maintenance. They have walkways that go to their power towers. So in a marsh, they've got to make sure that those the walkways don't fade away. Okay. I'm going to stop right about here for a moment. I want to ask you folks if you recognize this view from the meeting last Thursday that what you're looking at over here to the right was where the image of of the 2020 you know H, the 2020 bay road eight story buildings were arranged so this is about where that that view would be taken um so i'd like to stop here we're going to visit the bay trail but we're going to be going on here talking about the safer levy and the projects and i want to Uh, I want to kind of make sure that we're realizing when we think about these projects, they're still in concept form. And that means the developers laid out the biggest plans they could think about and they put on all this window dressing about things for the public. But what they all did was put in eight story buildings and try to build to the max you know, with some compromises over uh, in the Emerson uh, property. But that's, uh, so, so we have to keep that in mind because we're in a process. Those projects are dependent on what the update says they can do. And our voices talking about what's acceptable and the voices particularly of the community are what's going to be influential. Uh, in this process. So that's, it, we're at a beginning point. We can't panic when we see something on it. We have to say no where we don't like it or ask for a revision of something. But that's, this is a time to still be able to talk about that and to be, to be active as early as possible in that communication. That's what you need to do as an advocate. So let's walk down to the Bay Trail here and we'll talk a little about the levy there. So Eileen, we had a question come in on the chat online. Okay. 
And so, how will how will sea level rise impact biodiversity by habitat squeeze? Well, that's a big, big concern. Uh, I've got a question online about how will sea level rise affect biodiversity and species, and it is a huge concern. We wipe out these marshes. I mean, we already have endangered species living out here, and we wipe out habitat that the reason they got, excuse me, <coughs> the reason they became endangered was because we, they lost habitat by us building salt ponds and fill, fill in the bay and all of that. So if, if the sea level rise comes in and if we can't build up those marshes, then we're going to lose that biodiversity. And biodiversity changes with sea level rise with climate change in every habitat, we're seeing that happen, whether it's in the mountains or by the bay or by the beach or wherever. So it's, it, it, is a, it is a threat and the animals, some can adapt, some may not. We hope more do than not, but it's a concern. So the picture I was showing online was, I, I think one of the pictures isn't loading. It was, right, the, right. it was, well, I was just talking to the people online. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see if it's, if it's. Um, so uh, we've got a question about, is it reasonable to be asking at this time that they push, you know, setbacks? Uh, you know, in, in this building oh, back away from the bay. And that is, it's always reasonable to ask such a thing. So um, yes, uh, it is a time that, that the, the value of those setbacks needs to be emphasized and uh, communicated. So I would say, you know, there's, there's always time is the present, the decisions have not been made. And so the question was just added on the question of height. Height and other features are all up for discussion right now. <laughs> so um, doesn't mean that you know the developers want that, but we need to say, and the community needs to express. So, okay, so we're at a point here and we'll move if a car comes. I can't see back there. So you tell me if a car is coming. Um, there, the safer levee is going to run all along the shoreline for, to there and down along there. And the question is just where? And as we go through walking on the tra trail here, think about that. Oh, oh so they're, they're, coming, they're coming through on the trail. Okay, so we bike bike approaching. Sorry for the interruption, but um, go ahead. <laughs> so the question that keep in your mind is where is this going, and we'll talk about that more. A levee, a sea level rise levee, like the one in San Jose, will be about. Fifth, that one there is about, I think, 15.2 inches, two feet tall. Um, the, okay, so a levee, like in the San Jose, that levee is going up, planned at about 15.2 feet in height. Now, most of our existing levees are about 10 feet. So if you realize that, you'll see it's an additional five, but it may be more as sea level rise comes in as how tall these levees may be. So that's the height. But in order to support the height, the footer, in San Jose, it's 100 feet, maybe more. And so you have to have that much space below it to support a, a, you know, something that's going to withstand the bay's waters if they're coming at you at that, with that, you know, at sea level rise levels. So that's something that is part of the consideration here. There are places 
on upland where they can try some different techniques to strengthen it when they're on upland areas, solid ground, but not so much on mud flat. So we'll just, it's something that I uh, want to kind of keep in mind as we go along here. Now I'm going to take us down to visit the harvest properties property first here on the Bay Trail. And I will point down the road, this first piece of land with actually a, a power tower sitting in it, that is a parcel owned by Harvest Properties. And then past the power station, the, the, that's, that starts the frontage of, of their property for the building they want to put down on this along the roadside. So that's this end of what's fairly long. The, the, the lands along the bay extend about four tenths of a mile. So we're going to head out, not all those four tenths, but we're going to head in that direction. Like, I mean, you have to know how the clapperial population is doing down here. It's doing, it's actually doing pretty well. I can talk more about that a little later, okay? Because uh, I was going to cover that. I wanted to introduce you to marshland right here next door to us that uh, runs right up to, you see, to the levee. So we have that running right up to the levee across the trail from um, where they want to do some kind of development. So yeah. that's something yeah. that to that proximity is important to realize uh, as we think about what we're doing. Okay, let's head on down. We've got uh, Myrna taking pictures of Grindelia. That's out there. That's the yellow flower we see out in the bay. And if you see some orange down there on the bay, that's called daughter uh, or uh, the devil's sewing thread. So, but the pickleweed, this is predominantly a pickleweed habitat, and we can see some of it sticking through. And king tides, it does. So it, it, yeah, it would look like this if it wasn't getting fed by the tides. <laughs> so this is a pretty, yeah. yeah. These are halophytes. The plants out here are known as halophytes. They're salt tolerant. So um, that's uh, what we're going to be seeing here. Maybe mention what lives in that. Well, I will be. I'm doing that later. I've got a plan. No, that's not their planning. That they're planning a building on that property right up to the edge of the power station. Yeah, they're playing. They were looking at. I mean, I think that was the window dressing in their concept. They were making this some kind of a park area underneath the power towers, uh, and so uh, that's. But it's to be determined what happens with any of this land. Uh, so we'll we'll see. Well, I, I don't know about that, but the property owner is a recently purchased all of the land around it. So um, PG&E would have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Prince, is PG. Hey, Eileen. Yeah, yes. Could you repeat that question that she asked? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm getting Sorry. questions about the power station that's here, and someone was hearing that power stations are going to be expanding. Are are going to be expanding, and uh, 
and she wondered if that was an issue with this power station and certainly it's not anything that I know about and I know that Harvest Properties is a recent buyer of you know for, of these properties around it so it's between pg and &E, I'd say and Harvest Properties as to what any expansion that could happen here. <laughs> Yeah, this is a Saturday morning. He uh, brought up in the conversation. I've got a question from someone asking about when can we start talking about eminent domain and climate change? And that's a good question, politically sensitive question. And I don't have a direct answer to that. <laughs> we're, we're gathering, I wanna stop here if I get, I'm waving the group to come join me at a spot here uh, that's uh, just past the power station. <laughs> oh, good way traffic. We have a lot of traffic on the trail right now. So we need to share. <laughs> So folks, I um, wanted to stop here and this location, and we, we may have to do this and I'm going to have to shout, I think. Um, that outer fence of the PG&E power station marks the beginning of where, uh, you know, where we can look back here at harvest properties, which then extends back over into the land behind it. So all of these trees, the land behind it belongs to Harvest Properties. So behind on Bayfront, uh, on Bay Road, at that frontage area, they had planned uh, an eight story building and they plan another one right there. So those eight stories are still gonna look pretty tall from this location. And on this one will be slightly closer to the bay than, than that one. But that's the current you know, plan they had plan this area for some amenities, but that's really, who knows? <laughs> okay, let's keep moving. Is that a concern for visual reasons? Or is something? Hmm. Uh, the concerns about the tall buildings, even that close, are the same as far as light, noise, glare. Um, they because they're so close to the shoreline and they affect you know neighborhoods beyond so um there's the same issues occur uh the extent if they extend shadow into the marsh is dependent on some on nearness um but that's but we we have to still look at those buildings with all kind of the same impacts in mind including bird collisions so Yes, it is. Yeah, someone has brought up the fact that they're aware uh, of, you know, by having worked here in the past in part on some of this property, of the fact that there's contamination um, in this area and uh, on the, of, of the lands that Harvest Property has. And that, that is a fact. And um, it is known to Harvest Properties that that exists. So that's something that they will have to deal with in their development. I believe though, some cleanup has occurred. It may not, you know, so I, but that, and I was told uh, when we talked to them, indicated that the contamination was really more down toward these two eight story buildings than buildings further down where, where it was located. I, but don't have any certainty or specificity. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wondered if water gets out here, 
you can't see it underneath the marsh, but we've got some open water pans here. And this is not from, and as we all know, that's not from the rain. Yes, <laughs> no, it, uh, it has, the, the tides come in twice a day, go out twice a day. Okay. And, uh, you know, it may not be high enough that we see them until, let's just king tide. low and high tide here, the reason is that it's going up and down two feet. Oh no, it's much bigger than that. So, um, I, and it depends on which tide measurement table. So, um, you know, so that you're, what, which they, they come out differently, but I can't give you what, I don't have a number to give you. Um, someone was asking about what the differences is in the height of the tides. And I, on an average tides difference, I don't, I can't give you that answer, but there's a mean tide measurement that I'm sure that can be dug up. <laughs> well, the moon controls the tides. Right, absolutely. And that's, you know, so I was on the question is that we think the development's affecting how high the tides go up or down. I would say, and I am going to stop everyone about here. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to stand out here and will somebody tell me if I have to get out of the way, please. <laughs> because um, the, you know, the question of, I got a question of whether, you know, the, how wide the range of tides are. And I don't have you a good number to give that uh, to give you on that one, but it is uh, it, we do get a king tides. It'll be starting. It'll be hitting at you know here. But what that means as far as what that foot measurement is, I can't I can't give you a number on that. But there is the, so this not there could storm effect. You can have storm effect on a tide, but the moon is actually making some decisions for us. So I bring you here, we're standing by the site that if you turn around and imagine there'll be a six story building built virtually right up to the trail. All right, that's the proposal. And a little further down this stretch, the four story building is proposed to be built. Same relationship to the trail. So, these are buildings that are doing all those things close to the marsh that affect the marsh itself. And in the case of the buildings that direction, there are some communities down in that area that might would be affected uh, on the other side. But I want to turn you around and let's, yes, I have a question. Is there a, a question? Is there a salt marsh harvest mouth in this wetland area? You lead right into my next discussion. Because, because Perfect. He's asking about if there's a salt marsh harvest mouse out here. Well, and and, and <laughs> right, right, right. They're trapped. Okay. They're drowned. Right. Number I will. Two, all the sound, the noise from the construction yeah. kill them. That's a violation. We have someone here who knows quite a bit about the salt marsh harvest mouse and oh, what his needs are. Sorry. So I'm very glad to have other people who can speak to that because we, the more people know, the better it is and the better understood. And if I'm leaving something out, obviously you're going to help me. So we're looking at what the marsh that has been managed for about 25 years by the Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge. The underlying land is actually owned by the city of Palo Alto. The county line is down there, and the city had acquired this apparently in conjunction with all of the baylands it acquires and has down there and it maintains as healthy baylands. Um, but they don't have jurisdiction here. And the problem of the city not having jurisdiction made it, made it difficult for them to manage the lands. So they turned to the wildlife refuge and they turned, by agreement, turned it over to the refuge and its federal. Uh, jurisdiction now. Now, what Palo Alto didn't give the refuge the, the survey map, they, but the refuge understood it was 
from the levy on out. It turns out that in the purchase, the reach of the purchase that occurred by harvest, that those parcels own a band of land that runs from Bay Road down here and cuts all over to, a little further along this where this band is, and then down all along this stretch. So um, that was seen then in their designs, their original designs with them actually uh, thinking, well, we can put some things out there in the marsh. <laughs> well, we some of us met with Harvest and they said, no, we decided we're not going to do anything in the marsh. We're not going to muck with it. So um, we're hoping an arrangement is made where they, they arrange for the refuge to still be the manager of these lands out here because the refuge knows what it's doing. Now, what's out here? These marshes, this, these marshes all along, along here are known to be um, home to uh, where am I? To Ridgeway rails that were formerly known as California clapper rails, uh, the federally endangered species, and also the salt marsh harvest house that uh, is th this pickleweed marsh, this pickleweed, which is named for a plant where it's, if you look at its stems here, here's some pickleweed. No, I'm going to be very, but if you look at pickleweed and just pull off a stem, it looks like little pickles. So, but this is a habitat on which the salt marsh harvest mouse depends. It lives its whole life. You'll never find a salt marsh harvest mouse in anybody's house. This is where it lives. So um, they're hard to find. And so it's pr protected as critical habitat for the mouse. They only do surveys here and there for them but it's enough that we know that the, the, the animal is still surviving and, but that's, we can predict that it's here. But if you're a mouse who only forages at night and there are lights cast on your habitat, you're revealed to the passing owl or possibly the raccoon, skunk, possum, rat, or roaming cat. So, and all of the species that live out here are ground nesting, ground foraging, and are vulnerable. Their nests are vulnerable. They, 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 so they have, they can be really impacted by uh, being revealed at night. So that's the, those are issues that happen here to, you know, to our habitats and, and our species and are living close to them. So something that we need to keep in mind as we think about this. But I want to point out, I call this their habitat. But now this habitat, we already know, protects our shoreline, right? But do you also know it's one heck of a carbon exchange engine? And we've already talked about that it actually filters our water for the bay to maintain a clean bay. So it's giving us clean water, protection, reducing emissions. It's our habitat. This is our habitat. It's human habitat. It's not just endangered species habitat. We all need it. And that's where we need to take action that keep it healthy, keep it thriving wherever it can be. So that's... Uh, picture to keep in mind. Now I want to, uh, and that's something that, it, you know, to walk along marshes like this, think about it. We need it. We need it. And I, I think it's often, oh, why worry about a little mouse? Well, we ought to. They're our canary in the coal mine. They don't make it. It means there's not, we're losing marsh. So question. Um, so when you're talking about um, the plan being you know, still proposal stages and um, revisions can be adjusted. Are there groups that are people that are just like opposing it all together? Because it feels like ideally this just would not be built. I would say this probably there are people that would, there are people that exist that are opposing it all together. Uh, as an advocate, I know that just to come in in total opposition, then nobody listens to anything you have to say. So you need to be more specific need to talk about 
the impacts that you want to avoid, that impacts that 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 should be something that that particular jurisdiction wants to consider. And uh, that's where you're going to get them to listen and pay attention and add it up. So, you know, I, to just be vocal and say no, 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 is not enough. We need to be more informed. We need to be, you know, more suggestive of alternatives like setbacks on buildings, please get them back from it. Keep the heights lower if they're going to be anywhere close to the shore or the neighborhoods. So those are um, the kinds of things. Now, this is a city that's looking to development to help, you know, its general fund, right? So um, they've got that motivation to consider because that means they take care of other things for the city. We have a bite coming, folks. Who plans with the 100 foot footprint of the levee go on? I'm getting a question of, so whose land does the levee go on? <laughs> and I'm glad you're keeping that thought in mind, Naomi. So um, um, yeah, so is the levee, this is not any 100 foot distance. And there is in the old specific plan, a you know, it, there is something that says we should not be, when we have to build, you know, when we have to build that levee and build higher and wider, uh, for sea level rise that we shouldn't be filling the bay. So they have that there. And sometimes it helps to remind them what's in their own documents uh, because the community expressed that in 2013. Question. I was just gonna add a little bit. The way you described it, it sounds like there's several violations of CEQA involved. This is a CEQA issue. You can't build on there, you're not allowed to. You can because unless somebody's willing to stand up and sue, developers can do that all the time. They'll cheat. But building in a, in a, in a dangerous species habitat is not legal in California. That should be caught right. in CEQA. One of the, uh, I have a question here talking about CEQA and how these things seem to be violations of CEQA. They're actually not not all directly violations of CEQA, but under CEQA, they have to consider all the applicable law. And, and the law that that is that is administered by regulatory agencies. So that's the Clean Water Act, uh, the, Fish, the Endangered Species Act, uh, other contaminant acts. Now, someone has already mentioned there are toxic materials on this site. There would be some EPA interest in that. Now, if it's been sealed, is put in the ground and sealed, it may be able to leave it there, but they're going to have to make sure that whatever they do would not cause it to spread from where it is. So there are important things. But in CEQA, these questions, are they looking at that? Are they looking at mitigations for, um, for, for those kinds of impacts? Now, in the terms of impacting a wetland, it does happen and it will happen when it's a project that can't avoid getting into the wetlands. And indeed, as we'll see here, this levee may not be able to avoid getting into the wetlands, but that's, they look at, it's under the federal side, NEPA, where they have what they call least environmentally practicable, uh, environmental, uh, east, at least environmentally damaging practicable alternative. All right, just let me get that right, it's called LEDPA. At any rate, that so looking at practicable, it's going to say, you know, um, you know, they were going to put some re-landscape this, wake away all this and put in some pretty plants or hedges or whatever that was in the original, you know, a plan. Uh, and so, but the water board is going to say, you can build, put a, you know, plants and put, put non, you know, those non wetland pants anywhere and you are destroying wetlands. So it's not practicable for them to do such an action. So that would be stopped if it got that far uh, by a water board uh, decision. So, but if it's the levy and it's how they're gonna connect in a certain place and it gets into wetlands, then the practical part, maybe it has to happen and then it has to be mitigated even then. It's not like they waive mitigation. That's just that the damages have got to be uh, dealt with. 
So that's the kind of the things that would go on here when they get to that point. Now, um, pardon? Oh, okay. So uh, we're going to need to keep on moving here, but I, um, you know, they said they weren't going to do anything in the marshlands. We just hope the other developers are thinking in that way. So we're going to head back, we're going to head back to Bay Road and take a visit on the other side. While you're walking that way, will you tell them about how close this side would be to the, to the trail in, the, well, in, their, in their description? Maybe they already all saw it on your... Well, that's... Um, I'm not sure what... Murray is asking about if I talk about how close this building would be. They, they did put in a little patio area in the front, but essentially the building was not really set back to any significant degree in, in their in their concept drawing. Let's remember. <laughs> well, they have come before. When do the proposals? Question is, when do the proposals come before the city? These proposals have each been coming before the city planning commission and city council for presentation purposes. Um, and the, the city council planning commission may ask questions um, and, and raise some comments, but they are not going to be making any decisions about these projects because it's too soon because they don't know what they're going to do with a specific plan. So Eileen, I have a question. Okay, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Susan. Yeah, are there are there Ridgeways rails near where you are at now? There are definitely Ridgeway rails out here. We can't see them, but these rails, uh, the question I have online is whether there's Ridgeway rails out here and there are definitely Ridgeway rails out here. Oh, we can't see them. Very good at staying hidden. Uh, and you, if you get out here a lot on some lucky days, you might see one. Uh, they do exist out here. And if you come in the evening or early in the morning, you may hear them call. They've got a very distinctive call. Well, right. Well, the problem is they're not. I think Myrna is pointing out that, you know, one of the things they look at is are there places where marshes can move inland? And if they build all along here, they're actually putting an end to any possibility of that happening here, even in spaces like this, because it's. Well, the levee will, they will do an outboard treatment on the levees, I'm sure. But the, uh, that's the, you know, the, we refuse wherever we have. The on the, in the adaptation atlas, they have lands that they indicate are unprotected, but are a little bit inland near the shoreline. And if we could protect them, that they could be possible lands that have some use for incoming, you know, adapting for the incoming rise of sea level rise. So that is something you might want to look for if you do look at that atlas. But that's, we try to look at any land and is it something that could still serve us for protection? So I'm going to walk uh, on down to the Bay Trail from here. Uh, without, except for questions, I'm not. I'm not planning on stopping. <laughs> San Francisco Bay Shoreline Adaptation Atlas. It's on the SFEI web, website. Okay, but just Google it and you'll find it. <laughs> hey, Eileen. There, there's also a link to that on the calendar. That, too many people here. Well, somebody's asking about depopulation of the area. That's not in the adaptation atlas.
or trying to. <laughs> Well, go to dirt.com and, so, and see what you can buy. Well, they, someone's asking where does clean, clean dirt come from? And the current sources and their standards for testing, it has to be checked. But uh, when people are they're dredging in our creeks, when, you know, we're, you know and cleaning out uh, sediment that's collected and that sort of thing. And down in the South Bay, Valley Water has, does that with uh, with this, it's creek work, and it's using that to help, uh, doing that to help build a uh, transitional levees on the in the salt pond restoration project. Bicycle, bicycle on your right or southbound. A lot of it comes from creeks. It can come from a development project up uphill, you know, away from uh, areas, and if they're doing some. In fact, you know, doing something, digging up to build something else. Yeah. Species coming into the bay right now with mussels and things like that, right? That are endangered. Yeah. So we have to be careful about bringing the bay fill into areas. Right. So I'm getting questions about uh, clean, you know, clean dirt and where it comes from, and these the there are a set of uh, tests that dirt has to go through to demonstrate that it's you know clean enough to meet the water board's standards. So, uh, but we do bring in, you know, certainly uh, we get things in the fill, mussels and things that just come in board ships. <laughs> Okay, I have another question about dirt, and I, I can only go so far with my expertise, but go ahead. <laughs> One of the things, this is a, there's a, been a big, uh, the Corps of Engineers, when it dredges the center of the bay, we'll talk about where it's come from, they actually, because they have to clear a channel, for deep ships, they've actually been taking it out into the ocean. And so, so, and so there's efforts going on to see if there's a way to change that. Uh, and get it, we can, but then we have to have a place, where do we store it? Where do we, you know, this is, so this is, there's technical difficulties, put it that way. Let's stop right here. Okay, folks, we're going to stop here just a moment and take a look on the other side of Bay Road. And if we look down there behind the cyclone fence, you'll see, and besides that, that actually that um, concrete block fence, that is property of 2020 Bay Road. That's their frontage on that. That's that project. And its first eight-story building would be built in that stretch. Now it's between other uh, built properties that are owned, and one of them being the salvage yard. So this is yeah, that we're going to take another look at as we walk just across and into the open space preserve. Uh, so our next stop is just across and on, on the bridge that enters the, the open space preserve. Well, so this is that salvage yard she's talking about. I have had some, I got Susan. And they're, and they're walking along here. I'm just I showing them a picture. Thing from Susan. Okay.
Okay, folks, that channel I mentioned, this is where it comes. It's still at lower tide. You can see the water will rise and it extends back around here. And we're gonna go out, get off the bridge and then talk about it. We're heading out on the Bay Trail. Now in this location, the Bay Trail goes on a levee that forms the outer boundary or inner boundary of the Ravenswood Open Space Preserve. But as you see, what the channel's doing is leaving the reserve and going out into the marshes and areas beyond it. So at this point, it's bringing water to other places, not just the reserve. So, okay, I wanted to stop here before we move on, on down to a couple other places on this side of the Bay Trail. Um, as we look across that channel, we'll see it runs way down there. In fact, it runs in a semicircle all the way around the preserve. It reaches the bay and therefore it has inputs with the tides from two sides. That really improves its ability to hydrate the marshes that we're going to see lying ahead and along the channel itself. So I want to say to you, So I want, I want to say to you, where does the levee go? There's a salvage yard owner who knows that how long that salvage yard wants to be here, right? And they come right over to the edge of the channel, right? And that's for this part of it. Where does the levee come in after it crosses Bay Road? And uh, so we're, this is a challenge that faces and decisions that lie ahead of how, where will that be placed? Uh, putting it, anyone think about what happens if they try to put it in to this side into the mud? We're disrupting the channel. So it's, it's a, we're really affecting a broader area of habitat than solely than where the levee would, might have to go at that point. So we have some serious, considerations here um, on impacts to wildlife and just the hydraulic flow of our marshes. Levees that are low like this, built by the Chinese after the gold rush, and then we have more substantial levees. So let's move on. That, that is, that is, uh, you know, uh, I'm getting a question here from James about uh, pollutants that come from what bay tires and bricks. Um, tires said? and brakes. Brakes, yes. Yes, those are major runoff items and they come, actually, a lot of that comes from runoff on our roads uh, that is then not treated as it goes into creeks and heads to the bay. And that has to be monitored and can be monitored. Uh, San Francisco Baykeeper does a good job of keeping an eye on that kind of thing. But when you see that, and they, they use these shredded tires to like put some fill in middle of roadways, and those kinds, that, that again produces those contaminants. So it's, it's upstream where those come from. Uh, yeah, we see tires in the bay, but uh, it's a, most of that is probably coming from upstream.
right, right, right. James is pointing out damage that could be occurring here at the salvage yard uh, from it being in one site for a long time. So that's that's close nearby. I walk up here. Right. Walk down here a little bit further. Yeah. Well, okay, I was going to talk about this site. I was just moving down a little bit further. Yeah, well, so uh, for a runner. Trying to get beyond these trees. And I move too slow. Okay, I can stop about here. Okay, we've got, I think we have somebody walking down the trail, but keep our eye on someone coming through. Well, we're standing here, the property from the end of the salvage yard down to, if you can see the, the property ends and turns a corner. This is the frontage a bit 2020 Bay Road has on the bay. The property in there, uh, I don't know everything about what used to be there, which is a question that James raised, but uh, this site had big toxic problems as a company called Remic, R-E-M-E-C, and if you wanna look it up, you probably find stories about the really bad um, contamination issues that occurred here. But that underwent EPA you know, or, or oversight cleanup, but there are still toxins on site. Again, they will often, if they don't clean out, they will seal and let's, we have a person approaching um, in, in the ground and they have to build to make sure that that's not disturbed such that it might spread and, it, and get exposed. So that's, those are, that is an issue on this, this particular site. Um, and that, so that's, I don't know all of what went on. <laughs> so you know, is that, is that the... I think I don't have to pilot I'm to introduce Chip Gribble, who we talked earlier. He's uh, retired from the California Department of Toxic Substance Control as a project manager on sites like this. And he might have an observation for the group about what we see here. Thanks. Good suggestion. All I, all I see is everything's covered with concrete, old foundation elements, which is probably, I guess, I don't know anything about this. I'm just guessing. It probably serves as a cap of some sort to reduce uh, groundwater or rainwater and surface water infiltration. Right. But that also suggests that there's a lot of contamination that's left in place. And here we go, we're right next to the bay. We got a site that makes remediation projects for each of these things. But it's a potential problem in the future when the sea level rises if not current. And also, uh, what we just had is a nice description of, uh, and I'm going to summarize quickly, but that, that what we see in the paved areas is probably uh, sealing the, the site so that the toxins are, are protected and, are, and, and are the, it's an impervious surface deliberately so water is not infiltrating and forcing these toxins to spread. But uh, with the changes in the site, we can expect that they're going to have to look at are those changes going to force 
make any changes on the kind of protection that they keep to that. Uh, and it occurs to me that when you're building on this site, this location along here, we'd be looking at by their concept, four eight story buildings. So, you know, guys, like up there. And um, the weight of those buildings, how it's engineered to not disturb the, what's underneath them so that you know there's no movement in the in the toxins there's a lot that's going to happen and i'm sure that th that would be something that this kind of regulatory process would have to occur related to development on this site so that's that is uh something but it, it you know needs to be handled and it needs to be handled well and the public needs to be conscious of it so they're asking good questions <laughs> The offset as I just it seems like you couldn't build, you know, X beach. Well, I was power line. Yeah, I, have a, I have a I have a yeah, I, I have a question. I have a question of about the offset for power lines. Uh from what I know from work that's been done around the bay, PG and E doesn't move its power lines. Right. So uh the builder has to that easement exists and they have to build to address that in wherever they build. So um, if you notice one of the buildings on their line thing on their plan was to be horizontal or you know the long wall to the shore, not deep. And that may be to avoid that kind of easement. I can't be certain, but that's that's uh, just a out of my head thought of kind of out of you know what they're doing. So yeah. Okay, we're gonna keep on going one more stop before we turn around to finish our tour. Okay. <laughs> Usually that's maybe a couple of feet and it varies. You see where the sloughs are? The highest parts of the slough of the of the marsh are right next to the sloughs where the sediment builds and built up. And it's in those areas. James asked me how tall the, the marsh is. And if you, the variation in the marsh seems slight to us, but there is variation. And where we see little sloughs running through, the mechanics of it are that those sloughs bring sediment. The sides of the marsh next to the slough build up. Those become the high points. And out in the bay, that helps to differentiate which vegetation will grow. Um, we've seen the flower grandelia. We'll only see that out in the marsh on some of the higher berms that have built up. It's the least, it's the least uh, salt tolerant of the mix. And we'll see cordgrass with its standing roots in the water. And then we have a, you know, pickleweed kind of grows in between there and a lot of other halophyte plants that uh, can exist out here. So that's, uh, there is variation, but it's not a, uh, uh, you know, not super deep in, in nature where you can see, you can see at the side of the, you know, this is the height of pickleweed. So kind of look out there and then it depends on the sediment level. Right, right. So, uh, If people compare this to marshes on, let's say, the East Coast, they have different kinds of vegetation, and that vegetation is on an open plain that grows much taller, but much more even. They form by nature that they branched out into the marsh over time, and as the tides come in, they've been formed. Uh, and and seem to maintain themselves, which uh, uh, and this will be part of a pan area, but it, it's also an area that's used as habitat sometimes for some species for foraging. And uh, so we have uh, the grasses in the water are cord grass. We have a native species, but there's been a uh, Invasive species of cordgrass that 
was introduced to the bay and a lot of our cordgrass now is a hybrid. Uh, and scientists usually talk about that most, most they're running into hybrids everywhere. So um, that's what I'm hearing from them. Okay, folks, I think we can stop here. So this is a photo was in the in presentation the other day. What we're looking at far out there is the site of the Emerson Collective or East, East Palo Alto Waterfront uh, project. And uh, where the buildings are is kind of the center of where their development concept was built out. And if we look at the trees beyond the trees, the trees beyond are in a neighborhood that's right across the fence. So the marsh that we see here um, on from the other side of that channel is all owned by the Emerson Collective. If we don't, it is dependent on this channel. This channel that runs here, the one we've been watching, right, yeah. is its main channel of tidal water. So it is successfully feeding this marsh now, but will it thrive? Who knows? Now, uh, that's something that um, I would worry about particularly. And, and so that's something that I want to keep in mind. If we could turn the lights out and it was dark and there were uh, 12 new buildings, four eight story tall, two seven, two six, two, five, two, four, arranged over there, what would we see? We would see light cast. We would see, you know, factors that are affecting not just here, particularly here with the very low buildings There's possibly some small lights around those buildings now, but this is a dark place at night for critters and it can be substantially changed. But if you think about it, that light is hitting homes that are just behind as well. The skies are going to change. Um, missing some of our group here, but um, next Thursday, we're going to be having a presentation on wildlife. And Susan mentioned that we'll have Shani Kleinhaus presenting to us. Shani's doctorate is in ecology, um, and she's done a lot of things, but in the last 10 years or more, she became pretty much uh, one of our expert that I go to on bird safe design and more recently on uh, the dark skies movement, light pollution. And when you listen to her, think about what these projects might be doing to the marsh, to the neighborhood, because there are impacts for both, both species and humans and it affects the sky above and the migration of birds. So um, she is you know, someone that you might wanna keep that in mind while you listen to that presentation. Um, so those are, um, you know, on, on this, this site, we don't know what's happened. It seems far away from us, but it would be massive just the same. So how big should that be? And where will the levee go? If, you know, is the levee going to cut off that marsh or is the levee going to go up against their land and, and protect their land and the homes behind? One thing I want to mention here, you'll hear sometimes mentioned a loop road. The, the first specific plan suggested the concept of a loop road, which would extend from Bay Road essentially through Emerson property and then on along the backside of where those homes are and then go around um, in that, through that neighborhood to connect to University Avenue. They thought it would help traffic. It would help some local traffic, but even the city is realizing, and I, I've gone to a fence I could see through over there and the roadway is not big enough to be a major roadway, right? And it would, in order to build it, 
they would have choices of uh, damaging the adjacent marsh because it goes immediately against marsh or infringing in the backyards of the homes on the other side of the fence. So it's an issue with the community on that basis alone. Uh, and those obstacles uh, suggest to me it's going to be hard for them to move that forward. But that is being mentioned in some transportation discussions. So um, that it's, it's a still a concept and it, it's got, you know, it would be challenging to put that road through. Is it a loop road from Bay Road? Or? It connects to Bay Road through some existing streets and then would continue along the back of fence of their property over, you know, toward where it could then loop back around the neighborhood near, near the rail bridge, the rail tracks, rather. So. And excuse the question, but just to clarify, the land we're talking about is. It's both. Uh, the they own well they they well 2020 bay road owns this piece here there are some other owners with some property in here but emerson owns property that goes back in that direction and two of their eight-story buildings would be back on that side more toward bay road but not reaching bay road so uh then uh the semicircle of buildings that they plan is in this area kind of a near the about the beginning of where you see that mound of the dirt uh, and so that's um, that's at least from what I can my best guess from the concept <laughs> so um, yeah and the mound of dirt no it isn't deep um, it, it's it's a firm yes Anyway, let's. I think we're at the. We're at. Well, we have. We're actually on time. <laughs> we're shooting for eleven thirty. So I'm going. <laughs> so um, yes. I I just had one quick question. And yeah. that was, do you do you think if we had habitat loss in this marsh area that we've been looking at today? Is it likely that there would become additional endangered species compared to what it is now? Right. Um, I have a question from our online group about whether I think there is habitat loss in here would be affecting endangered species. And the answer is yes. When they have surveyed for Ridgeways rails, they have found Ridgeways rails on this side of the levee. So we know that they are out here. And so that's um, yes, Susan, the answer is it would impact them, of course, salt marsh harvest marsh as well. Um, and uh, but again, I say let's protect it as habitat for all of us and serving all of us and the species um, because we need this marsh to survive. So we're going to head back to the wall. I am, this is kind of the end of the walk. I don't have, you know, particular agenda at this point, but we can still ask some questions. <laughs> uh, someone has asked me if there's documentation available about these projects to the public. Yes, if you go to the Ravenswood business district specific plan update page. And uh, actually, if you just enter that in Google, that, those words, you'd find it. It has to be the update page. They have an information page there, where if you go down it, you will find links to those, the documents that are available. We don't have all the documents because this is not final on anything, but the concept plans um, and, and you know some other materials that are associated with them. But so you don't get all the documents until it's final. Remember, I, I was asked about how do we know that those aren't final? Um, they haven't gone through the formal process. Neither the Harvest Properties nor Emerson Properties uh, a Collective have actually filed 
an official application to the city. Oh, really? They presented a proposal. Uh, 2020 Bay Road has uh, their concept is out here longer than the others, but we have not seen anything that is associated with the application. That is not public at this point, uh, at least here. You know, so that's I don't know if they've made changes, but um, that's you know. So it's there are documents available, and you have to keep your eye open for when new documents might be and when these might show up at a planning commission meeting for consideration. Okay, I would, uh, they have to go through the CEQA process. Okay. So all of these projects are large and we'll have to go through a full CEQA process, which analyzes impacts and is supposed to provide mitigations to impacts where possible, or if they have a significant impact, uh, then maybe they can't even do that particular, whatever it is. Um, so those are, uh, the secret process takes us through that. Following the secret process is the permit process. Uh -huh. So that's where the, the regulators will write letters about CEQA to right. responding to CEQA, but they, uh, you know, their, their permits are subsequent. And so they go through a very thorough process. So uh, there's one, we have a few minutes here. Yeah, you know, wait till we get down the end of the show. There's one thing I, I've, I've heard some questions about, people raising questions about BCDC. Hello, everyone. Can we stop a minute? There's something that is a question I've, I've heard, or comments, questions, comments, that I've heard uh, multiple times where um, people are raising, well, won't BCDC take care of this? And it has to do with, we need to understand what BC can and cannot do. Um, based on the law that, that was passed by federal, the, the state legislation that established the commission, right? BCDC's actual jurisdiction is a 100 foot band that lies from mean high, mean high, high water to inland 100 feet. That's it. So what's gonna happen on those lands is what they have jurisdiction over. Now, BCDC does many other things and they're pushing forward a lot of things like Bay Adapt and major projects, looking at trying to bring the Bay more together on some regional planning. But those are plans that don't have any weight to them unless there's legislation attached that creates regulatory powers. Now, BCDC seems to be the right, you know, right agency to be regulating a lot, but they don't do that. So let me describe a typical process that, that happens uh, whenever anybody digs in mud by the bay or in our creeks, jurisdictional wetlands, right? That project has to file for an Army Corps of Engineers permit, which is called under 404 of the Clean Water Act, right? And the Corps of Engineers requires for that permit that it have our regional water quality control board complete a statute 401 under the water quality act which is under the clean water act which is a water quality and also that there be opinions from u.s fish and wildlife service from uh and there can be some regulatory powers by the way and opinions from the california fish and wildlife uh there might be depending on the site national marine fisheries involved um, and there may be EPA. It just depends on the project, right? And interestingly, in that process, BCD chooses to be the last one to issue its permit. And that is only applies if there's a band of land running through there, their band of land. Then uh, they have by that time seen all the other permits and they will then utilize that to establish what they will permit or not. So 
So that's, there's a lot of confusion, but it's a partnership among all the agencies because there's so many laws. <laughs> so BCDC is a spokesman on these issues. So you hear a lot about that and they do a lot of big planning uh, and we want to encourage that, but we're, uh, they, they're, they don't, you know, they don't bring down the, the, the hammer in a lot of cases. So, I mean, there are 100 feet here, we start where? It would be 100 feet from the channel? For the levee? Yeah. yeah. I mean, oh, they're banned. They're banned varies. It's interesting. And but if you look at the Emerson collective map, uh, map graphics online, they, they show the band. You know, that, yeah, but that they show the band and it places the band is fully in the marsh and places it touches the land. And so it, it meanders because the tides have to come in here quite a ways and they're still uh, for mean high, high water, not that high a certain, you know, till fairly out way out in the marsh. So that's why uh, that varies. But so all of these properties have looked at that. The band would affect the, this frontage here. Uh, for instance, they plan to put an open space park-like area out here to allow for the band on 2020 Bay Road. Um, those are, uh, you know, things that they're allocating. I think that the building setback that's that's proposed on on uh, uh, the Harvest property land that doesn't look like 100 feet to me. So, um, but I don't know where the band sits. So that. It depends, and I actually they they have one of their their uh, detailed charts shows their band as well, which may have some of the similar situation where it's not really quite on land. So we still have to protect, act to protect the wetlands. It's mean high, high water. So they have a certain, that whatever that level is at a given location. If so, if the sea level rise, is that point? That will change. That will change. Okay. Bye. 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 There's definitely bicycle people in our behind us. They're coming. It's, it's, it's Saturday. People are out doing their thing, you know. <laughs> I don't. Um, you know, they have um, they've recently done some things to fix the top of it because it's part of the open space preserve. Um, and I am assuming it's at about the 10 foot height you know, that was done, it was a levee built at some time in the past. Um, and I don't, uh, I, I think it was, can, I don't know the whole history behind it. Um, the question, a question I have, we're walking on the Bay Trail on a levee. Will this Bay Trail section be outboard of the levee or inboard of the levee? And if so, where will that be? So <laughs> all kinds of things that can change the, quality of life here. Eventually, if you leave it outboard of the levee, you eventually don't have a trail here. Unless the trail moves inbound on your bare property. Yeah, there's, there's some of that. We have some concerns about putting them on top of the levee when they're right up against wetlands. Yeah. So it, has, uh, it was just suggested that in Foster City, they're putting a uh, trails on top of levees. And so um, in that case, there are just some different designs that are being suggested for how to accommodate that. But um, whatever, you know, I think Foster City is pretty far along in what its plan is. And it's, it's, uh, it is next to wonderful mud flats. Build this levee higher? It would it'd be, have to go wider, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, I'm not sure what the width is. It's a fairly, Broad spread. Well, Maria is asking about building this one higher, uh, and uh, if we do, then that means they're cutting. There, they have to worry about cutting off the connection 
inside and out. So they, there can be, levees can be built as they're doing down at the Don Edwards Refuge in, in Alviso with uh, water uh, culverts built into the levees so that inner marshes can be uh, provided with water. Uh, but all that design detail is yet to come. Yeah. We don't even know where it's going to be. I, I Right. Yeah. Yeah. The question has to do with, you know, well, a levee does not, doesn't cut off the creeks. And when we have a major creek, obviously we need to keep the watersheds able to flow. They're talking about um, what I've heard, you know, they talk about uh, uh, gates that we put on uh, uh, certain areas to uh, provide some protection, but there's going to be a sea level rise effect on the creek waters. But, Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. So there's all kinds of things. So I think we're we're about done with our tour, and uh, we'll just walk on back. I thank everyone for coming. Thank you. Good conversation. Good questions. We can keep talking as we walk back here, but I think we need to let the online people know that. Essentially, I think we've covered the turf that I'd hope to cover today. So thank you. Thank you, Eileen. <laughs> the mud okay, thanks. Thank you, Eileen. Hello. All right, I'm gonna end the uh, live stream. Okay. Hello, Susan. Yep.